Um, I remember years ago uh, in Brighton, uh, the phone rang one day mid-tournament, and uh, I won't use the player's name because he still plays around the circuit. I still see him every now and again. But the, the wife phoned up and said, uh, all right, is my husband there, please? And obviously all the privacy laws and whatnot with casinos, we weren't really supposed to say that people are in or not in because that was just the rules. Anyway, she's like, look, I'm going into labour, okay? The ambulance has been called. I'd just like to just talk to my husband, please. So I was, I hang on, all right, fair enough. Bit of an extenuating circumstance. So I go over to the guy and I tell him, look, your wife's on the phone. Uh, you're not answering your mobile. Um, she just wants to talk to you. Apparently the ambulance has been called and she's going into labour. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go and give her a ring in a minute. Okay, so I go back to the phone and I say, uh, I'm sorry, um, he says he's going to call you in just a minute, okay? And she's like, okay, thanks, no problem, bye. So I put the phone down. About five minutes later, the phone rings again. And it's this lady again, and she's saying, look, he hasn't phoned me yet. Um, and I just I just want to talk to him before I get in the ambulance. The ambulance is here now. Um, could you please just get him for me? So I said, right, just wait a second. And I go up to the guy, and I'm like, come on, man. I said, your wife's going into labour. Like, for God's sakes, just go in two minutes, just walk over to the phone, just talk to her two seconds, say good luck and and whatever. And he's like, look, mate, I said I'll phone her in a minute, all right? And I'm like... So I'm not telling you how to live your life yet, but if my wife's going into labour, I would want to talk to her or whatever. And he's like, I'll phone her in a minute. All right. So I leave it, go back, and I say, I'm really sorry. <laughs> he says he's going to phone you in a minute. Um, so I hang up again, and uh, about 10 minutes later, the phone rings again. And I'd, you know, I was running around doing rebuys, and, and I realise he's still in his seat, and he's not moved. And the phone rings again, and I answer the phone, and it's this poor woman. And she's actually screaming down the phone at me that she, all she wants to do is talk to him. So I just march over to this guy and I'm like, listen, mate, you're disqualified from this tournament if you do not get up. Go over there and talk to your wife right now. And he just went, after this hand. I was just like, right, your cards are folded. Go over there and talk to your wife right now. End of story. Otherwise, you're out of this tournament. I just couldn't believe I spent the rest of the night just thinking that there's so many more important things in the world than sitting playing a game of poker in a £10 rebuy tournament. And this guy just couldn't have cared less that his wife was going into labour. Just amazing. <laughs>
So now, is with the open door policy and the much bigger casinos, you know, it's not seen as an elitist thing anymore. Obviously, down, you know, St James's uh, Park and the Mayfair areas, it's still very different. But nowadays, I think people perceive it as just a somewhere to go for a night out rather than somewhere that hard gamblers go. Well, again, at the time, poker players still played casino games like there's much smaller percentage of them now that risk their money on casino games. Some still do, obviously, but at the time you would get guys who gambled in casinos playing poker. It wasn't like you went, not everybody went there just to play poker. They went there to have a punt and there was a poker tournament on. So there was one, there's usually one uh, dealer's choice cash game after the tournaments. No set rules on games because they dealt it themselves as well and um, there was no set rules on games or r no rake or anything like that yeah there was no limits on the buy-ins no they just used to play uh one two i think they played one two but it was all it was mainly omaha and irish holden no they they but they didn't they never ever played texas holden cash game because to them that was wasn't cash game poker they needed more action on the cash games, so the tournaments hold them, and then the cash games never ever hold them. In 2001, at the beginning of 2001, I decided to move to London. I didn't know anybody, but there was a casino uh, which is um, still there, the, the Tottenham Court Road. It was Gala, I think it's... Um, but they were offering a relocation package of a £1,000 cash for any staff that wanted to move to London. So it seemed like it made sense that I could get myself a flat and you know, get paid more money. But you don't realise you when you first move to a, some somewhere like London, the actual scale of it, when you live in Blackpool, everybody lives in the same area. So but when you move to London and you just pick a place on the strength that it's a flat and it's clean and you can afford it, you don't realise that actually nobody you know is going to live anywhere near you. And when you don't know anybody, it can be a massively lonely place, London, when you first move there. Yeah, two years there and then I went to work on the ships. Worked for P and O Princess, did a six month contract. First month in the Caribbean, and then five months around Europe. It just seemed like the natural progression. Everyone always talked about when we were having the interviews for the casino. I remember them saying, "Oh, you know, get in this job, do a couple of years, go out on the ships and see the world." And once I'd moved to London and heard, you know, countless people telling me how they'd worked in the Caribbean and done the ships and worked here, you know, it just seemed like it's got to be the thing to do, isn't it? Obviously, there's the officers. That's the beauty job on the ship, you know, with your fancy stripes and white uniform. But then the next step down from that is the casino stuff. So everyone below you is jealous that you've got a lot more opportunity and you don't have to work 10 hours a day like most of the staff on there do. You can only work when the ship's out into the sea just because of the laws. So it is a really good, uh, you know, it's a really good life on there. No, not really. It was, uh, it was just fun, really. You know, there was just a couple of roulettes, a couple of blackjacks, a stud poker table and... People just went on there for fun. Most people didn't know what they were doing. You know, the first two days you were just teaching people how to play and just having a laugh with them, really. It wasn't ever a serious... Obviously, people come onto the ship who do know about gambling and do play, play in casinos and are aware. So they know what they're doing and maybe some of them will be big gamblers. We did have a few decent-sized punters on there, you know. But it's just more for a good laugh, really. You're just there to entertain them and... That was amazing, six months on the ships. I would recommend anybody who works in this business if you're single. But another thing Carnival took away was paying for the flight. So I'm like £450 down before my contract even starts and I just said forget about it, I'm not coming back. And uh, I moved to Brighton, got a job in the casino, they were looking for staff. So I went down, got a job there and they also had a card room because the one guy left. Um, so I then went in as the assistant card room manager I suppose at the time. I'd been working on the casino tables for five years by that point and I'd just done six months on the ships solely working, the, dealing the casino tables. So even though I was an inspector when I went to Brighton and I was just watching the games I was a little bit bored of just the same old thing day in day out so and I enjoyed the poker when I did it as a dealer so I thought why not give it a go. It went, um, it went pretty crazy yeah. Uh, we used to have uh, an 80-seater 80, 80 uh, card room and um, poker four nights a week. But the card room was just getting so popular. Like Thursday nights, we would have 80 players, no problem, on a 10 pound rebuy, self-dealt as well. We didn't have space for dealers. They were just these little round tables, so they had to deal themselves. 
and uh, guys would be buying in like 25, 30 times. You know, just, it was just mental. The prize pools were massive for these £10 rebuy tournaments. All done in one day because the casino closed at four. So usually we were finished by two o'clock, something like that. Most people were learning. You know, you had the hardcore cash players, but then most people were coming in and learning to play tournaments at this time. Like nobody wanted to mess with, go on those cash games. So few of the tournament players would, would mess around with those cash games because they knew those guys were serious and they had money. I was just thinking then, as you know, I only ever gave one ruling in my whole time in Brighton on the cash table. That was it. The whole they sorted everything out themselves. They never had any problems, and just just one time in in the whole three years I was in that two and a half years I was in that card room. I actually had to give a ruling on the cash table. Of um, when I was there, it was a uh, Paul Whiting actually was running the card room in Brighton. He was my boss for a while there, and then he left to go on the ships himself. And uh, another guy came in and took over, but didn't really get on with it that well. And uh, we were having this tournament in the, casi in the casino, and it was the first time they'd filmed a poker tournament in a casino. And it was done really badly because Men and Motors, the TV channel Men and Motors, which I don't even think exists anymore, were filming it. So it was a total joke, but it was like the biggest thing that had happened in poker in this country because they were, for they were allowing cameras to actually come into the casino and, <clears throat> and film what was going on in a casino, which was just totally unheard of. And just before, about a month or so before that um, happened, the guy who was running the card room decided that he'd had enough and he didn't want to do this anymore. So he just walked out one day and never came back. So it kind of got left to me to run this TV poker tournament, thousand pound buying tournament. We had a hundred, 120 seats. Just as I left the um, casino in 2005, that was when the law started to change and the 24 hour policy went out. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? Well, especially when I first started, and you weren't allowed to gamble in casinos. That was the rule that you couldn't go in any casinos in this country. You know, it just made you want to do it more. But when they opened it out, the first thing everybody who worked in a casino did was go straight to another casino and, and gamble almost on the first day. You know, The first day off they had, they would go to the next nearest <laughs> casino and, and have a gamble, which is exactly what I did. As soon as I left the casino in Brighton, like the very next day, I was uh, right down to another casino at the other end of Brighton playing. When you're told you can't do something, you want to do it, don't you? I think a lot, a lot of people were concerned about was the fact that they were being told what to do when they weren't at work. You know, you always used to hear this phrase that, you know, if you pay me for my days off, then you can tell me what to do. And there was a lot of people who uh, felt they should be able to do what they want, really, and gamble. But for me, it was probably a good thing because, you know, I was a young 18-year-old and, you know, it takes over your life, doesn't it? This casino business, when you first get into it, you know, there's so much involvement and so many things you need to learn and, you know, it just takes over everything. I still remember as a young trainee, you know, and I'm sure every single trainee that's ever been a casino dealer has done this, you have to wipe your hands when you go away from the table. And I would get up from the dinner table and I'd be wiping my hands, you know, because it's just so ingrained in you to, to do stuff like that. So it does take over. And yeah, if, if I was allowed to go in casinos when I was that age, then I probably would have lost money in casinos at that age without a shadow of a doubt, yeah. The very beginning of the, the recession when it actually happened in 2009 and it really kicked off and then no one was hiring, and especially online gaming, people just weren't hiring. So I ended up going for four interviews with one company and they ended up pumping me for ideas. Well, how would you improve the site? We wanted a pre They wanted a presentation. You know, I should have been going for the director general of the company by the time I'd had four interviews. And, uh, and they didn't give me the job. And then a few weeks later, I look at the site and everything I told them in my interview was up on the site. You know, so many things I'd said to them that they needed to do were already implemented on the site by then. So people were just being more ruthless then. And I, I went for a slightly different job with another poker site as the VIP manager for, for the poker, which would have been an ideal job for me. I got down to the last two out of about 25 and uh, I went in for the interview and the guy then announced to me that the other bloke who was up for the job was just leaving that same job with poker stars. And I said, well, shall I just go now? At the time, that's how it was, you know, that you were going for a job with 35, 40 people, when previously it was three or four, and I just couldn't find any work. So I ended up, it got to Christmas, and I ended up just doing fun casino work over Christmas. But when, uh, when Christmas was done and there was no more work in the fun casinos, I ended up bumping into Paul Whiting again at a poker function and said, like, I need a job for a little while, you know, can you sort me out? And he goes, yeah, yeah, no problem, come down. So 
that's how I went to the Empire. It was starting to get known and starting to get busy and it was 24 hours so you know the boom had happened it was happening it was going mental by two, early 2010 it was probably at its peak then wasn't it so i went there just to earn some money and sort myself out and four and a half years later still there didn't want to go back on the casino for just 10 years of it really i'd done it all and didn't couldn't see myself doing it anymore there's just a lot less pressure to work in the card room. People are more relaxed. There's not as much money at stake. There was, um, it was just more relaxed. When I started the Empire, it was the most relaxed place to work ever. You know, it was just really chilled out. The punters were there to have a good time. But whereas when you're on the casino floor, there's pressure. You know, I lost 80 grand dealing blackjack to a guy at Tottenham Court Road. And, you know, you could just feel the daggers coming from pit bosses and managers, you know, it was, it was, and there's nothing you can do about it, but it's it's just hard work to go in and do that every single day. More relaxed, good time, and that's how it was at the Empire, you know. And I, and I didn't have the pressures of being in charge at the time either. I was yeah. I was just a dealer, so you know it was nice to be working for a start, earning some money, and then my girlfriend on my back to get a job, and and it was a job that I enjoyed and I could do with no problems whatsoever. Well, I've always said this, casinos attract the strangest breed of person that there is. Always, from my first day, I noticed that you don't see these people on the street. You know, <laughs> you don't see these people walking around. They're just all attracted to the nighttime action in casinos. And now it's 24 hours, it's a little bit different. And now we promote it differently. Well, now we don't promote it as a gambling. We can promote it now. When I first started, you couldn't advertise. You couldn't advertise gambling because it was seen as gambling. Now it's a leisure industry that you can advertise and there are places you can advertise and tell people about what offers you've got on. So the different kinds of people that go in casinos now is, you know, it's infinite compared to how it was when I first started. It was just gamblers. Now people come in to have a drink and watch the football and socialize with their friends and have meals and, and poker just kind of it's perfect for that sort of environment, really. You can come in for £50 and you can stay 10 minutes or 10 hours or two days. Online poker just changed everything, didn't it? When I first started, it was the same roughly 60 guys coming and playing the tournament. And they would go to Bolton on Tuesday, they'd go to Manchester on Wednesday, they'd go to Sheffield on Thursday, they'd come to Blackpool on Friday, maybe Saturday. You know, they would just all tour around the north of England because those were the only games there were. There wasn't 24-hour gambling. They would play in the back of shops and you know, play wherever they could play because there wasn't as many games. Now, everyone's got access all the time. There is no end to the access you can have. So now, rather than playing, rather than planning poker playing around your life, you can plan your life around playing poker or vice versa. So you've just got more and more options now. It's so much easier. And I think people have adapted to that. People come in, some guys, you know, you get them getting up at four in the morning to come in at 5.30 in the morning because they know everyone's going to be drunk. And they can come and pick off a few drunk guys on a Sunday morning and make a few quid and then go and spend the rest of the day with their family. Whereas in the old days, you had to be at the casino at 7.30 because that's when the tourney started. And then if you were lucky enough to get to the final, whatever, you won some money or you go out and you play the cash game. And then you go home because the casino's closed. A lot of people can't live with the fear. You know, if you go on that bad run and for a couple of weeks, which happens, doesn't it, where you can't hit cards and you're getting rivered all the time and you end up doing a big chunk of your money, some people just can't live with that, not knowing when their next paycheck's gonna come. But some people have adapted to that, can manage their money properly and treat it like a business, don't they? You know, you see guys with their apps now they know exactly how much they're winning every single penny. I'm sure it didn't used to be like that. Guys just had money, played poker, and it wasn't a business then. Because there wasn't as much, there wasn't as many games. That's to say, you were tied to being in that place at that time to play poker. Now, guys are on the lunch hour, popping in for an hour, or coming in for an hour after work, or after a night out. So you just your options are just so open now. Yeah, I mean, I do, I respect people that can live with the fear and grind away at one, two and two, five games. 
you know, and manage their money that way. I, I do respect that. I don't think I could do it though. Uh, I've seen it a lot over the years. Nice people turn into not very nice people because of gambling. Um, I always remember when I first started, there was a nice guy, taxi driver he was, uh, used to come in, just pop in when he didn't have any work and have a little gamble and it got to the stage where he was doing a job, going to the casino, gambling that money, going back out, doing a job, driving back to the casino, and gambling that money. And I remember working in the reception one day and he kept, his dad marched him in there, he was a grown man, and his dad marched him in there and demanded he hand, you know, he resigned his membership and that we wouldn't let him back in anymore. And then the next day he was in there begging us for his membership back, you know, and he just turned so nasty, you know, he was no smiles and, you know, it, it was sad to watch really. But some people have addictive personalities, don't they? Some people, you know, once they start doing something, then they throw themselves into it. You know, you, you love the, f the feeling of those little bursts of adrenaline you get from playing poker and hitting that river and trying to control yourself. And, you know, it, it is addictive. Endorphins are addictive, aren't they? And poker creates lots and lots of moments of excitement and disappointment. <laughs> Look, everyone's their own man or woman. You know, you can't tell people how to act. But unfortunately, you do see guys who are on losing streaks, losing the plot a little bit, and it ruins the atmosphere at the table. And you do want to pull them aside and just say, well, you know, why didn't you have a week off? Well, I can't have a week off. I need to make some money. Yeah, but you're going to do your money the mood you're in. You know, it's it's hard. Like I said, you can't tell people how to act. And it's a shame because it is a, a game of pleasure. It's a game. Okay, it's there for people to have fun, be entertained, and have a good time. And when someone at the table you can is ruining it for everyone, you know, it makes it hard work. But unless they're actually physically abusing someone or verbally abusing someone and really overstepping the mark, you can't do anything about that, can you? You just have to let it play out. In the Empire, uh, the worst one, you'll have to give me a minute, but the best one definitely was um, <clears throat> um, dealing the final of the Pot Limit Omaha in the World Series. Five grand Pot Limit Omaha. That was a really good experience. No mistakes. You couldn't, couldn't make a mistake because when you've got people like Howard Leder on the table who know exactly how much the pot is at all times, you know, you can't say a digit wrong. So it was a lot of pressure, but a lot of fun as well. And something I'm pretty proud that I did. I, any, all the World, World Series experiences were, um, were good. Even I dealt the first year and supervised the second year. And they were both really, really good. I had a lot of fun doing those. Met some very interesting people and got to deal to all the you know, the Doyle Brunsons and Phil Ivies and Helmuths and Dan Negranus of the world that deal into people who are considered the best poker players in the world and famous for just playing a game, then, you know, it's like any anything, isn't it? If you play for a non-league football team and you get into the third round of the FA Cup somehow and you get a trip to Anfield, then, you know, it doesn't get better than that. And I suppose it's the same for a poker dealer, you know, dealing to Phil Ivey is like, it's pretty good. So that definitely... The two World Series in that final table were definitely my best experiences at the Empire. There's always times, like certain times of the day when you work certain shifts that you know are going to be hard work, like working from 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock on a Friday, you know you're just going to be absolutely hammered from all sides. And if you're one staff member down or two staff members down and you know you can't open the required amount of tables, that I don't like. I don't know really. I keep thinking about that. I maybe don't want to do this for the rest of my life because 16, nearly 16 years doing the exact same thing. It's not really the same, but it, it is the same. No, there's no light, there's no windows. It's the same people every day, you know. It's the same arguments every week. It's the same issues with dealers all the time. No, look, don't get me wrong. As a job, it is a great job. It's very sociable. Um, the people who work in casinos tend to be clever but lazy people so you know that they're always going to have good banter they're going to be nice people that they just can't be bothered doing something with their life which i would definitely put myself in that category clever enough to do something with my life but just too lazy because you get stuck in this easy job and you have a laugh every day and i've been thinking about it recently do i want to do this forever